Hey family, okay, so today we're going to be going over tithes and, pass and the Passover, okay? So this is the last little bit about, you know, just the basics about your relationship with God and getting to know Him, okay? And then we're going to go into learning about the devil, okay? Because you can't fight your enemy if you don't know Him, okay? So first we learn who God is and what he's all about. And then we're going to learn the devil so we know, you know, when he approaches, okay? And then we're going to, we're going to, after that, go through and see why God said Jesus contradict him, okay? So let's get to these tithes and the Passover, okay? So tied in. Okay, I don't know about y'all, but, you know, what I was taught growing up in church is that, you know, you give your 10% out of each check. Every time you get paid, you give your 10% to the church, okay? That's what I was taught, and that's what I have been doing since forever and ever and ever, <laughs> okay? But what do God say about... Okay? tithing okay he does tell us to give 10 percent of our profit but it's not every time we get paid it's actually every three years mm -hmm. and then he doesn't tell us you know to give it to the church either okay I don't know if there's two types of different tidings because I know it's one part he was saying like, you know, give it to the poor, okay? The homeless, the motherless, the widows, okay? Um, and then he also tell you to take 10% of, you know, your first fruit and he tell you to go and sacrifice it to him in the land that he tell you to, okay? So, we're just going to go over that a little bit, okay? So, we can have clarity and understand it, okay? Okay, so we in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, okay? And it says, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tenth of your grain, New wine and olive oil and the and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he would choose as a dwelling place for his name so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. Okay, so just in that part. God is not even telling us to give our 10% to anybody, okay? But to sacrifice it in front of him, and he's telling us to eat our own our own first fruit. So to me, that sounds like, this is just my opinion, okay? But to me, it sounds like, you know, God can't eat, okay? Because he, he don't need to eat, okay? But it sounds like he liked the smell, okay? He liked the smell. It's kind of like when you're driving by and you, and you like, smell somebody cooking out. And you like, ooh, I smell the barbecue. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I smell it from all the way over here. <coughs> I'm sorry, you guys. It's like sickness keep going around in here and time you think you're over it you get it again okay so it's like god knows he, he can't eat these foods okay so he wants you to cook it in front of him okay so he can smell it and then you just you have to eat it in the place that he wants you to eat it at okay like a uh say like a dwelling place you know how um David's son, Solomon, how he built, like, a building for God. This might be the same thing. Like, God might, you know, every now and then tell a prophet or something, okay, this is a place that I want you to build for me that, you know, everybody come here 
to make their sacrifices, okay? So this is what it is saying here. It's saying that, you know, be sure to set aside your 10th, your 10% each year, okay? And then, <coughs> sorry, go to the place that I'm telling you to go, okay? And then I want you to eat it in front of me, okay? But if that place is too distant and you must, oh, too distant and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe, tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. And do not neglect the Levites living in your towns, for they are no old, for they have no allotment. In, or inheritance of their own at the end of every three years bring all the tithes of that year's pro produce and store it in your towns so that the levites who have no allotment or inheritance of their own and the foreigners the fatherless and the widows who live in your town may come and eat and be satisfied and so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands okay so this is a little confusing in this part because at the first part it's saying you see God is telling us every year to bring a tenth and to sacrifice it and to eat in front of him okay but then once you get towards the end, it tells you at the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce. Okay, so I know it sounds confusing, but this is what is God saying. Okay, every year, once a year, you go where God tells you to do go and you sacrifice, okay, and eat in front of him, okay? But every three years, okay, so the third year, every time you do that, okay, you're going to use that that tenth, okay, and you're going to place it in the, in the town where he have you to go make the sacrifices. Basically, you go go share, okay? So every year you go go by yourself to make the sacrifices, but every that every third of the year, okay, it's hard <laughs> to say that every three years, okay, you're gonna share with the the people in the town that can't, I guess you can say, afford to make the sacrifices. Basically, share with people who don't have it, okay. So this is what God is telling us about the tenth. And not one did he tell us that we have to give it to, you know, a church, okay? You're supposed to give it to people that really need it. People that are in, basically people that are in need, okay? Because it says the foreigners, okay? The fatherless, okay? The widows, okay? Okay? These are people that don't have nothing. They have no allotment or no inheritance. They don't have nothing. And I know how it feels to not have nothing. And you just need a little help. Or you just need a little bit. You hungry. And nobody wants to share with you. See, this is God telling you to like. I want you to help these people out, okay? Because I have helped you. I want you to turn around and help them. See, God is teaching us how to be like him, okay? He's showing us how to be giving like him. 
every uh, every day, all day, 24-7, God is giving to somebody, okay? And he's not asking anything for it. He's not expecting anything because God already knows. And he's all powerful. So what can we actually do for him besides, you know, probably, you know, try to help people understand him, grow closer to him. That is, that is about as much as we can probably do for God because he's all powerful. He got everything. So it's not much we can give him, but the least we can do is show our gratitude. He say rejoice, eat in front of him and rejoice. So he's like, you know, I know this food, you know, can't do nothing for me, but I just want you to be here with me. Do you hear that? I just want to be, I want you to be here and sit here at the table with me. I want to see you be happy here with me. I want to see, you know, I just want to see, <laughs> you know, I just want you to be here with me and be happy. That is what he's saying. Cause it's like, he's not eating. He can't eat. Okay. So he's just inviting the people to his table that has been doing what they supposed to do. Okay. It's just like people, you know, when they say eat with the people that, you know, helped you out, okay? So, it's the same thing with God. It's like he's inviting the people that that did the right thing, that was out, you know, testifying about him and what they did in his life, okay? He's inviting them to come and sit at the table with him. And to be happy and to rejoice about how good their year was because they followed him and his rules and did what he told him to do, okay? And, and we just going to be happy together at this table, okay? Okay, so God is real, he's real straight to the point, okay? Simple, straight to the point, okay? And I love that because it doesn't leave any gray areas. One thing about me is I hate gray areas. I hate it. I hate not knowing. It bothers me. <laughs> it bothers me so bad. It's some. It's sometimes God might not reveal certain stuff to us because he feels we're not ready yet. But he's always clear when he does tell us but even in those times when he's telling me to do something and then I'm like okay what's the next move that after that because I like to know I'm not I like to know every step but he's like do this step first and then I'll tell you the next step <laughs> but even then I'll be like ah, I need to know every step <laughs> I don't know but I love how straight to the point and clear he is because at first you know when I was I, I listen to the Bible while I'm sleeping, sleeping, and then I, I also read it. And so, you know, I was always going like, I know we're supposed to sacrifice, but how was they actually doing it? And then I was able to find like exactly. So it was clear like, because I was just wondering like, are they just cooking the food and just leaving it there for the animals to, you know, eat or something. Like, how was they actually doing it back in the day? And then I found the passage where it's like, they're cooking the food, but they're also eating it. But it's a specific place they got to eat the food. They can't just eat it at their house. They got to go to a place where God tell them to and like a pure place, a clean place. It's kind of like eating Eden, God only dwelled in Eden because it was pure. They wasn't allowed to do anything unpure in Eden, okay? So it's kind of like the same thing. He, like, finds a place that's clean enough for him to be at, okay? So so he could, we can all be in his presence and feel good and be happy and rejoice and eat good together, you know what I'm saying? Okay? So, real short, straight to the point, 
no gray areas. You know what you're supposed to do, okay? So 10%. You know, what kind of confused me is because back in the day, their currency was more like for animals. They had money, but money wasn't really used that much. It was more... They had the bartering system, so it was like they traded stuff. They traded animals for grain or, you know, grain for clothes and stuff like that. So it's like, how would that, how would we bring that to the modern terms, okay? How could we modernify the 10%? Would it be like we take the 10% and invest it back in into ourselves to grow, would that be it? And then like every three years, we take the 10% and give it to somebody in need, like our money, since now we use money more than, you know, animals and stuff like that. Because right now, what I do, I'm going to just tell y'all what I do. Right now, every time I get paid, I give 10% to an organization that I believe in, which is, um, I really got a big heart for kids. I love kids, okay? And so, you know, I give to like EPAC, EPAC, I hope I'm saying it right, EPAC, okay? And they specialize in you know, stopping children, human and children trafficking. So I donate to them. I donate to St. Jude's for kids' cancer. I de donate to March of Dimes for, you know, preemie babies. And I love animals, so I donate to, you know, um, animals, you know. I try to, you try, I try to do the best that I can. And even if it's something local, like if I just see a homeless person outside, um, <clears throat> I try to do my best to help them in whatever way that I can. So, you know, <clears throat> I'd rather give my money and know that it's going towards really helping people. Because it's a lot of, you know, organizations that say, you know, they're there to help people and, they, you know, take people's money and sell them hope and dreams and lies. And then, you know, they take that money and it's not used for the community. Like the community is still hurting, but they organization is growing and growing and growing and i tell you god says you're not supposed to take from that 10 percent. okay you're not supposed to use it let me see if i can find that verse because they also talk about first fruits and tithings and deuteronomy 26 so let me see if i can find it Mm hmm okay we go pause real quick let me see if i can find it okay it's right here around me 26 it says i have removed from my house the sacred portion and have given it to the levite the foreigner the fatherless and the widow according to all your commands i have not a turn I have not turned aside from your commands, nor have I forgotten any of them. I have not eaten any of the sacred portion while I was in mourning, nor have I removed any of it while I was unclean, nor have I offered any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the Lord my God. Okay, so what do y'all think? Do you believe that God is telling us in that part to like, that we're not supposed to touch it for ourselves, okay? And that we're supposed to just make sure we give it to those in need, okay? Or is it that we're not supposed to touch it, period, when we're, like, experiencing bad situations, okay? That Because that could be tricky, okay? Because it kind of sounds like he's, 
like they're saying, because it's not even really God saying it. It's like a prayer. Because if we go back to the context before it in 12, it says, when you have finished setting aside a tenth of all your produce in the third year, the year of the tithe, you shall give it to the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. And then it says, then say to the Lord, your God, I have removed. So it's like, it's telling you, it's like a prayer afterwards. Like, I have done what you told me to do. And now I'm saying this prayer, I've done what you told me to do, okay? I've made my sacrifice. I've given to those in need. And now, God, can you bless me for the next year? So, if you're taking, if you're supposed to, if, if people are giving you their temp that's supposed to be used for the community, for the widows, the less fortunate, the homeless, the fatherless. If that money is supposed to be used for, for that purpose and you taking any piece of that from that, okay? How are you being blessed? And... If it appears that you are being blessed, are you being blessed by God? <coughs> because if 100% of that 10% is supposed to go to the father, the wither, wi widow, the widows, <laughs> the fatherless, the Levites, okay, the foreigners, how do you have anything left to be... Um, I guess, growing an organization, okay? That's tricky, huh? That's why it was this, you know, this kind of the debate on the internet about churches. And I was like, you know, if you read the Bible, it was never, you know, the prophets going inside of a church teaching. They traveled and they taught. They didn't have churches. Okay, they traveled and they gave God's word without asking for anything. And God blessed them. And they use their blessings to help other people. Okay. So if you build in these churches, <coughs> how are you helping anybody? You're talking to the same people every week. Why is nobody getting healed? People supposed to get healed so they can go out and heal other people. But if everybody is staying in this one building, never getting healed, never going out helping anybody else, is any is it working? Is your system working? I don't know. That is one of those things you got to touch on later. <laughs> but, you know... I just feel like, I guess this is my opinion, I just feel like God said to me um, not to build a church. Religion, all religions, all cults, okay? So he told me just to teach the word. He didn't tell me to build a church, okay? I don't need to. We have the internet. I can just talk to everybody through the internet. I can talk to people during my day-to-day -day interact, you know, interactions, okay? But he told me not to build a church. 
They all have hidden agendas. It's supposed to be about God, but more people are more obsessed with the religion than they are God. It's almost like they forgot the purpose. The purpose of the church was for God, and now they no longer remember the purpose. It's about him. But the religion is more important to us than him. Putting on a show is more important than him. Selling dreams is more important than giving his truth. Leading his people the right way. Okay. So. We're going to go to the Passover now. Okay. So you're going to find the Passover. In Deuteronomy chapter 16. This is very. The Passover is very important. Okay. Because he talks about it here. In Deuteronomy. He talks about it in. Um, the book of Joshua. The book of Jubilees. Um, it is in, it is very, very, very important to God. Okay. He. It, okay. I'm going to. We're just going to read over so you can know why it's important. Okay. So the Passover is important because it symbolized when God freed Israel from Egypt. Okay. So it says, observe the month of Avi, or it'll be Nisan, which is the month of March, April. Okay. It's somewhere between. Okay. It's like March, April. Okay. Because the Jewish calendar is different from our calendar. So it'll be somewhere between March and April. Okay. So I guess you would say around the time that people celebrate um, Easter is when you should be celebrating Passover, okay? So, and celebrate the Passover of the Lord, your God, because the month of Aviv, he brought you out of Egypt by night, sacrificed as the Passover to the Lord, your God, an animal from your flock. Or heard at the place the Lord will choose as the dwelling for his name. Do not eat it with bread made with yeast. But for seven days eat unleavened bread. The bread of affliction because you left Egypt in haste. So that all the days of your life you may remember the time of your departure from Egypt. So he's like saying like you're going to eat this bread without yeast because you know when you're in a in a situ a fleeing situation, okay? When somebody's out to get you, you don't have time to get everything that you need, okay? So because you didn't have time to get everything that you need because you're trying to get out of there before that person gets you, you go leave some stuff before, stuff behind, okay? And so because they was trying to get out of Egypt, they left some stuff behind, because, uh, behind okay? So they had to make do with what they had, okay? What they remembered to bring with them and so they had to make bread without yeast okay and so god said because you had to do that then we're going to make this a tradition okay to to symbolize you know us getting out of there and him making sure we stay safe you know getting out of there. even there we don't oh sorry you guys even though we had to rush and get out of there we left some stuff behind God still made a way, okay? And he's a redeemer. He gonna give everything back, but we still able to eat, okay? Okay, so the bread of affliction because you left Egypt and hey, so that all the days of your life, you may remember the time of your departure from Egypt. Let no yeast be found in your possession and all 
your land for seven days. Do not let any of your meat you sacrifice on the evening of the first day remain until morning. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so, um, you're going to sacrifice a calf or a herd or a flock or whatever. And you're supposed to eat it at night, okay? Because that's when they fled from Egypt at nighttime, okay? And you're supposed to eat every bit of the meat before morning, okay? The next morning, okay? And then the rest of the six days, you're supposed to eat the unleavened bread, okay? You must not sacrifice the Passover in any town the Lord your God gives you. Except in the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. See, God always chooses a place for them to go and sacrifice at. You can't just sacrifice any place that you want to. It got to be somewhere that God choose you, choose for everybody to go and make the sacrifices at. Okay. There you must sacrifice the Passover in the evening when the sun goes down. And the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. <clears throat> okay. Roast it. Okay. God said cook that meat. Okay. Don't let there be no no water. I mean, I'm talking about water. Boy, I'm tripping. Let Don't let it be no blood in it. Okay. No pink meat. Okay. Roast that mug. Let's get some a little burnt on it a little bit. <laughs> Let me stop. No, but he does say cook it, okay? Roast it and eat it at the place the Lord your God will choose. Then in the morning, return to your tents. For six days, eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day, hold an assembly to the Lord your God and do not work. So he said on the seventh day, okay, when he said hold an assembly, that means y'all everybody come together, okay, on one accord, okay, and celebrate the Sabbath. See, the Sabbath is very important to God too. And he says why in the book of Jubilee. And it's because he, um, he rested on the Sabbath, okay? And it shows that God is saying, I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not willing to do, okay? So even, so since he was willing to sacrifice, you know, to to rest on the Sabbath, he wants us to rest as well because our body needs it. We go crazy if we work seven days a week, 24-7. We'll be going crazy. <coughs> we'll be sick. Our bodies need to rest, okay? So he like rest, okay? So get on one accord and y'all all rest on the Sabbath and do no work, okay? He even put it in the Passover, okay? Okay, so both of them are very short and straight to the point, but I just want to go over them because they're very important to God. Giving your 10% is very important to him. He made it very clear to me when I, you know, to get my 10% every time. And also this Passover. I haven't celebrated a Passover yet, okay? Um, but I'm going to do it next year, okay? Because I wasn't really clear on how it's supposed to be done. I kind of talked about it a little bit with a pastor when I was living in Kentucky. But, you know, I had never done it before, so I wasn't really, really clear. But, you know, since I've been studying... Now I'm clear on exactly how I'm supposed to do it. But I don't eat meat, so I don't know how that's going to work. Maybe <laughs> maybe I can get me some tofu. <laughs> I don't know. That's, eat me some tofu on the first day. Mm, I don't know. Maybe. And then eat unleavened bread for six days and just rest on the Sabbath. I don't know. We'll see how we go work this out next year, okay? So, those two things are very, very important to you. Well, to you because it's important to God, okay? And, you know, I want you to remember this about the Passover, okay? Look it up. Look up the month that Passover 
is celebrated. The time frame that Passover is celebrated. And then we're look up Easter. Okay. That is the start. Okay. Of what we're going to get into. Okay. But I want you to just remember that. Because when we go over it later, you're going to be like, okay, I'm starting to see the connections. I'm starting to see what God is talking about. Okay. So God tells us that if we follow, okay, his laws, okay, if we do what he tell us to do, we will be good, okay? So I'm going to just read to you what he say, okay? Hold on. Okay, so it says, follow the Lord's commands. The Lord your God commands you. This day to follow these decrees and laws carefully. Observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared this day that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in obedience to him. That you will keep his decreed commands and laws that you will listen to him. And the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possessions as he promised, and that you are to keep all his commands. He has declared that he will set you in praise, fame, and honor, high above all the nations he has made, and, um, and that you will be a people holy to the Lord your God as he promised. Okay, so God is telling us that if you follow his laws and commands and decrees, you will be blessed. You'll be blessed. You'll be protected. And he will make sure, okay, he puts you on this pedestal above everybody. Like nobody would come before you because you are his people, okay? You doing this is telling him that you love him, okay? Because if you told somebody, you know, um, I really like you, okay? But this is what I require in order to love me. And they said, okay, I hear you, okay? But this is what I can give for love. It's just like, will you settle and just take the love just to have it, okay? Or will you be patient and wait for the love that's going to give you what you require, okay? And so God is going to bless those that love him the way that he's required and not in the way that we just choose to. You want to love him, you know, you want to do this and not that. You want to you wanna love him this time and not this time. It's like you know, consistent and you always do this and he going to bless you and love you and he going to have you up here, okay? And you go go and you go live a wonderful eternity life with him, okay? And then if you don't follow, he also tell you you would be cursed, okay? And he, he also talks about the curse. That's how we get these generational curses because people doing what they want to do, okay? They're not following the laws and the commands. They're doing what they want to do. Then they get cursed. And then the curse don't always hit them, okay? Sometimes it fall on the children and the grandchildren. And now they out here, you know, going through it and not knowing why. And it's because... Their mother or their great-grandmama, you know, chose to do things their way instead of doing what God told them to do, you know, follow his laws and commands. And now they out here hurting. And now they out here hating God because of not something God did, but what somebody in their family did. Okay? So we got to break these curses, y'all. It's time to break these generational curses. It's time to get free. It's time to give y'all what y'all need, okay? I'm not here to 
feel nobody's heads up, to give nobody, you know, feel you full of hope that don't get you nowhere, okay? We we plan to get somewhere. We plan to win together, okay? So I love you, family, and I'll see y'all next week. Peace.